I'm at the Atlanta History Center in Atlanta, Georgia. It's May 17th, 2006, and I'm with Mr. Gene Frazier, a veteran of World War II, who has kindly agreed to come in and tell us the story of his life and his military career during World War II. Uh, Mr. Frazier, I want to thank you very much for coming in here. It's an honor to have you here and an honor to tell, for you to tell your story to us. Could you give us uh, your complete name and your date of birth? My name is Eugene Frazier. I was born the 4th of July, 1923, in a little small town in Kansas, Hayfall, Kansas. Would you start off by giving us a summary of your upbringing and your military career and your, your life in general? Fine. If you don't mind, I'll read it so I'll keep myself straight. That would be great. My name is Eugene Frazier. I was a combat B-29 pilot in World War II. I was born on the high plains of Kansas on July the 4th, 1923, on my grandfather's farm near Athol, Kansas. My grandparents as children came to Kansas in covered wagons in the early 1870s. They were all farmers. My father owned a grocery store during the Depression and the dirt storms. After graduating from high school in 1941, I enrolled at the University of Kansas. During the first semester, Japan bombed Pearl Harbor. My high school buddy and I and another student lived in a one-bedroom apartment off campus. All three enlisted in 1942. Herb Borgman flew 30 missions as a B-24 pilot in Europe, and Joe Bossidy went Navy and is one of the five Navy Avenger pilots lost in the Bermuda Triangle off Fort Lauderdale. Many TV documentaries discuss this mystery. The road I traveled the next four years started with Army basic training at Jefferson Barracks, Missouri, then to college training in Fargo, North Dakota. Here I got my first airplane ride, a 65 horsepower Piper Cub, my first bomb with a two-pound paper sack of flour. Less than two years later, I would be piloting the world's largest combat bomber, the Boeing. B-29. From 65 horsepower to 8,800 horsepower and dropping two-ton bombs and incendiaries on Japan. From college training to Santa Ana, California for classification, physicals, mental tests, and psychomotor skills. To Oxnard, California for primary and soloing in the bi-wing steering. Open cockpit, white scarf and goggles. We had civilian flight instructors. Mine was movie actor Robert Cummings. To basic in Bakersfield, California where we had military instructors and mine was a veteran of the Spain Civil War. On to Williams Field near Phoenix, Arizona for single engine advanced. At graduation in 1944, my class was assigned to Europe flying P-38s, P-47s, and P-51s. I was selected to attend Advanced Flight Instructor School, Randolph Field, San Antonio, Texas, then back to Williams Field to instruct. A few months later, the need was for more bomber pilots. Williams Field converted into a B-17 transition base and after about 100 hours in the B-17, I was assigned a crew, and we learned to fly the B-29 in Pio, Texas. About three months later, we flew a brand new B-29 to the Pacific Marianas Islands. There are three major islands, Guam, Tinian, and Saipan, all approximately 1,500 miles from Japan. We were assigned to the 58th Bomb Wing, who had just arrived from flying missions out of India and China. We replaced the original crew of Little Organ Annie, whose note art 
the, the Noah's art of our plane. There were three six there were six bomb wings in early 1945. The 314th and 315th on Guam, the 313th and the 58th on Tinian, and the 73rd on Saipan. Many think the Pacific War ended after the 509th bomb group dropped the atomic bombs on August the 6th and August the 9th. An armada of 800 B-29s from all six bomb wings hit targets on August the 14th. My target was a Harare arsenal south of Hiroshima. Japan surrendered on August the 15th, 1945, and 462 B-29s flew power display in early September over the battleship Missouri as the peace was signed in Tokyo Bay. I was engaged to my hometown girlfriend. She made her a wedding dress out of a parachute that I had sent home. We will celebrate our 60th anniversary this year. We have five children, seven grandchildren, and three great grandchildren. After taking advantage of the GI Bill, I spent 30 years with an international forest products corporation. I was allowed to continue flying in the reserves and the Air National Guard flying fighters. The corporation moved us six times and we chose Atlanta to retire. Four of our five children live in Metro Atlanta. One son is a veterinarian. He came to Atlanta and we helped him build two animal hospitals. His sister manages one, his brother the other. Mother did paperwork and I continued to do maintenance and landscaping. Five minutes, I've covered my 83 years. <laughs> well, you've had an amazing 83 years. I'd like to go back and ask you a few questions about those 83 years. You mentioned the bombing of Pearl Harbor. What was your reaction and your friend's reaction when you heard that Japanese had bombed Pearl Harbor? Well, the three of us uh, were in our bedroom. We just had lunch. And the landlady came up and said, hey, you live and listening to the radio. We said, no. He said, well, you ought to listen to the radio. We tuned it in and learned about Pearl Harbor. Well, none of us knew where Pearl Harbor was. But it was right then. He said, well, we've, we've got to be a part of this. We're all 18, 90-year-olds. We're just the right age. And it wasn't shortly after that, all three of us enlisted, as I mentioned. My friend Herb Borgman that flew the 30 missions got shot up pretty bad. And he died about three years ago. And Joe Bossy is still missing. How did your family feel about you going into the service? Well, I like to say my mother sat on the edge of a chair for four years. Yeah. She was worried all, all the time. My th father. I uh, was too young for World War I and made a point of it to do. Since he missed that, I was going to have a chance to be in what was now called World War II. I mentioned to you uh, that one thing he gave me as I got on the train to leave hometown, he gave me a 1843 antique copper penny. It's about the size of a quarter. Very few people have seen them. And he just said, bring it back. I, can't, <clears throat> I carried it to those four years. You still have that penny? That penny is in one of my kids' memorabilia books. So quite... You mentioned your training. What, what was your feeling and your emotion the first time you went up in an airplane by yourself? By myself? Well, let me tell you a little bit of uh, a scare I got on. I had just soloed in the Stearman in Oxnard, California. And right after you solo, you became a pretty hot pilot. So I was told to go up about three or 4,000 feet and, and get a good feel of the airplane, do some acrobatics. Well, I got up to about 3,000 feet. And again, head on the goggle, it's open cockpit, noisy. And the thing started backfiring. 
and the exhaust is right beside the cockpit. Loud backfire, black smoke. My gosh, and, and we told we always be looking out for a place to do a forced landing. Well, I lost about a thousand feet when that thing was backfiring and and the prop actually stopped for a little bit. I kept hitting the throttle and then I realized, hey, you told me that the carburetor would ice up at times on the Pacific Coast and there's a lot of humidity. And there was a simple button you push for carburetor heat. I pushed the carburetor heat, get coughed a few times and took off. That was my experience in the very beginning of my flying. I learned to pay attention to, to the instruments and the airplane. Yeah. The Stearman was a beautiful airplane to fly for acrobatics. That was a small airplane? A small bi-wing. Built by the Stearman company that became a part of Bolton. Oh, okay. When you're at these various cities and sites for uh, training, did you have opportunities to go into town and deal with civilians? And, uh... Just about every place we went, particularly uh, college training in Fargo, North Dakota, uh, we had a lot of free time and on weekends uh, people would literally line up at the gate waiting for someone to come out to take them out to dinner. Really? Uh, this happened in primary, it happened in classification, we spent time at Santa Ana, and we had some some experiences and we talked it over with some of our friends post-war, uh, visiting various homes in Hollywood. Uh, they just treated us royally. Uh, I just wonder today how the American public would treat our, yeah. our soldiers today. Yeah. Because we were, we were elite, even though we just wore a uniform. When did you first find out where you were going to be going for your assignment, that you were going to the Pacific? Well, we knew this from the time that we started B-17 transition, because that's when they announced that we were closing the, the fighter base to become a B-17 transition. So it was kind of like uh, driving a Corvette and then getting into an 18-wheeler, <laughs> single engine to four. Uh, I was not very happy about it because I, I wanted to fly fighters. I'm going to go to Europe with my buddies and fly blow-up trains. I mean, this, we would get uh, movies of fighter sweeps of what was going on in Europe. So here we're going to be in a big airplane, and they told us we're going here. You're, you're going to the Pacific in the B-29. Well, I had never, I had seen a B-29 once on leave. The 58th bomb wing that I original that I it was the original bomb wing trained in Salina, Kansas. Well, that was in my hometown country. When I home on leave, I saw these 29, these big giants flying into the into Salina. So I had seen it from a distance, and it was a big airplane. Just seeing it from a distance, but I'd never been in a B-29 until I got to Pio, Texas. And that's where we got uh, about a month of training before our crew actually came on board. So how much training did you have before you actually had to fly in combat? How much? Well, the B-29 itself. We had about three months, about three months at Pio, Texas. And people that don't know where Pio, Texas is, it's about the farthest off the corner of the United States <laughs> that you can find. Uh, they call it Rattlesnake Air Force Base today. Right. It's inactive, but it's called Rattlesnake. Officers are not allowed to wear a good conduct medal. But the commander of the base, when we finished training, gave all of the officers a good conduct medal with a battle star. <laughs> really? <laughs> for serving in Pilot, Texas. <coughs> As a joke. It's on my board, but it's not on my rib. It's down in the corner. Serving as pilots. <laughs> Describe flying in the B 29 compared to some other planes. Well, the B 29 was the most sophisticated 
bomber in World War II. The only bomber that was pressurized like airliners are today. Our gunners in the back, the same as in the crew, flight deck. Uh, not only that, the B-29 was built by a slide rule. There weren't any computers to build an airplane like they are today. Yet it had two computers on board. One for radar bombing, that's bombing through the clouds. We had a radar, radar bombardier and that was his sole job was to, not his sole job, he actually could sight incoming kamikazes at night. He could, he could alert us to that fact. The other was the gunnery. Most people see the History Channel and see the gunners in B-17s and B-24s hanging on to their 50 calibers, firing out into the open in 40 degree below zero at incoming fighters in all their heavy garb. Our gunners sat beside a plex behind a plexiglass bubble. They did not pull a trigger. They had an instrument that they would frame the fighter and as it framed the fighter, the computer would automatically fire. The Japanese learned to stay clear of the B-29 because of that firepower. Not, there were four gunners. We had two side gunners on the airplane. If it can be seen from yes. here and here. The tail gunner was independent. He had two fifty calibers and a 20 millimeter cannon. He had the sole control over those guns. The central fire control gunner sat atop the fuselage just after the wing. He could see about 230 degrees above the airplane. So if any airplane, anything was coming in at that angle, he had 650 caliber so he could aim that at that incoming fighter. As it passed on by and be go on by, the side gunner on which side and they could coordinate by moving the gun, they would have four 50 calibers. Since we were pressurized, we would put on oxygen masks when we go over the get into enemy territory so that if we got hit by flak or by bullets, we wouldn't blow part of the airplane apart by de decompression. But we were, we were relative comfortable. We could be in our shirt sleeves on our entire trip. Even at the going over the target, we'd still have enough warmth in the airplane that we didn't have to have on heavy equipment. We had heavy equipment in case we had a problem. So the airplane When it, uh, it was on the drawing board in 1939, when Japan bombed Pearl Harbor, the government ordered 250 just from the drawings. <laughs> Eventually they built 4,000. That's in comparison to 26,000 B-24s and B-17s, each had 25,000. There were only 4,000. This model that I'm showing is belonged to the Confederate Air Force. It is now called the Commemorative Air Force, based in Midland, Texas. It is the only flying B-29 today. Huh. It's been in Atlanta several times and it uh, travels P Street to Cab. Oh, okay. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, if anyone is interested in the Atlanta area of seeing an actual B-29, it's, it's one at Dallas Air Force Base. It can be seen by the public. You don't have to go into the base and go through any security. You can drive right into the base, make a quick right turn, and you can go up and you can touch. You can't get in the airplane. It's yeah. a static airplane, but you can get this, a feel of the size yeah. of the airplane by going to Dallas Air Force Base. When did you go over to the Pacific? What year? In early 1945. Early. And how, how were you transported over there? We flew our own airplane. When we left, uh, kind of a joke, when we left classification in Fargo, North Dakota, we had a brand new Pullman coach. 
young people today probably don't know what a Pullman coach is. But it's a, it's a sleeper car. We rode all the way from Fargo, North Dakota to Santa Ana, California. Elegant style. But when we finished our training at Pio, Texas, we got a cattle car. <laughs> this is an old thing that had the bunks perpendicular to the rails. So as you go down the tracks, you have to hang on if you're in your bunk, even falling off. Well, they transported us in this cattle car from Pio, Texas to Topeka, Kansas, where we picked up a new B-29, and we flew it to the Marianas, as I mentioned. We thought we'd get to keep this B-29. It had a letter in the airplane that was built, bought by uh, some city in Minnesota. And later on, we wrote a letter to them thanking them for the airplane. But we didn't get to keep the new airplane. We were assigned a little organ annie. Not only did we get a little organ annie, we inherited the Saudi, the little black mongrel dog that the original <coughs> crew had picked up in India. So we inherited the dog that had more missions than any of the crew. My wife was waving at me. Well, I'm saying, tell them that, that it was supposed to be secret where you were going. Oh, <laughs> yeah, it was supposed to be secret where we were going. So when you had to make the field in California, on the jump off to the Pacific, we were handed a secret letter. We were to open after we were 100 miles out, oh. headed for Hawaii. Oh. Well, when we got out to check out the airplane, here comes a dolly out loaded with a whole bunch of crates. Spark plugs, Guam. So we knew, <laughs> knew where we were going. So much for secrecy. Yeah. So we went <laughs> to Hawaii, landed in Kwajalein, Guam, and then on to Tinian. When you landed on Tinian, what was your reaction when you first got on the land and looked around and saw where you were? Well, we, it turned out that we had to go up there at night. So it was a night landing. That's always scary going into a... Uh, well, we had to do that at, at Guam, too, at Harmon Field. Another kind of a f joke when we landed at Guam, we were taken by truck to quarters, and there was a valley of just crates, wooden crates. Found out they were droppable wing tanks for the fighters. We found out later, why so many? Well, government screw up. They had ordered 700 droppable wing tanks and they got 7,000. Oh, that was another thing that can happen, whether it's yeah. Katrina and yeah. FEMA or what. It happened back in World War II. Yeah. A lot of things like that happened. Yeah. So we landed there at night, and Tinian's only about 100 and some miles north. Guam. But again, why we went up at night, I don't know. Yeah. But we were assigned to go there. Yeah. Saipan and Tinian are twin islands. There's only a three mile channel between the two islands. So Saipan, when they took Saipan, when the Marines took Saipan, they lost a lot of, a lot of men. Tinian, they had a tactical maneuver, they lost very few men. It was a surprise that took the Japanese by surprise. It's a, it's a story that needs to be told of how the maneuvers, how they took Tinian, with very loss, very little loss of life. Would you describe your activities on Tinian and then when you flew your first combat mission and tell us a little bit about the missions and what the targets were, what, what the experience was for you and your crew? Well, every time a new crew comes in, the pilot is taking on an observer trip with another crew. So I flew my first trip with another crew, just, a, just as an observer. That target that night was Hachioji, which is a suburb of Tokyo. It was a, it was a incendiary target. We went in at about 10,000 feet, had, had no uh, opposition to speak of. Uh, the targets that, that we had, uh, 
very few were of demolition. I mentioned earlier, and there's a picture in here showing a two-ton bomb being loaded on Annie, Little Orange Annie. Uh, those we were at basically 20 to 25,000 feet. Try to at that time stay away from any aircraft, and at that time, well, we, the Japanese had learned to stay away from us because of the accuracy of our, of our gunnery. But most of our missions, uh, right at the latter end of the war, was incendiaries. These were bundles of incendiaries that were long. They were a cylinder about three or four inches in diameter, about four feet long, and they were in bundles. When they went out, they went out as a bundle, and they would break, and then they go down independently. And I'm sure you, we'll tell you the story about the Japanese that was on the ground one of those nights. Tell me again another question that you had. I might overlook one of the questions. Well, describe your emotions, fear that you had when you were in the air, or excitement or exhilaration? What, what were the emotions that you had at different times while you were in the air? Well, if I can remember when you were 19, 20, 21 years old, you were mostly invulnerable. Sure, you were scared. But I can't say I had the, the only fear I had on <clears throat> one of our missions, one of the first flying low level in at 7,000 feet, was that when the fire is burning and you fly over that fire, there's thermals. But as we were coming into the fire, it looked like any aircraft fire coming up. And it looked like just a wall of fire coming up from any aircraft. Intelligence had forgotten to tell a new crew that this was a reflection of the incendiaries going down. They're aluminum foil, so they were made a reflection that made it appear to be upcoming fire. So that made a little bit of sweat drip off your chin, <laughs> looking like you were running into that. But it was, uh, the greatest hazard was not from the enemy, but from the thermals. If we go in at 5,000 feet, we might end up at 10 because of the thermals. And with such a wing, big wingspan, you have a lot of surface for a lift. So the V-29 didn't have crews, can, didn't have power steering like an automobile today and like airplanes today. The airplane today is flown by a computer. So you have instant control. We had to fly the airplane. It had a wheel, not a stick. And you had to kick the rudder, and you had to fight by grabbing the wheel. And I'll explain a little later about one of our really scary experiences outside of combat. You know, what were your scariest experiences, whether it's in combat or out of combat while you were over there? Well, our scariest experience was when we had a skeleton crew. We didn't take any gunners along. We took one gunner for a scanner in the back so he could observe the, the engines and start the generator to start the engines and so forth. We had a, had a navigator a radio operator, two pilots, and we were navigating fighters to Iwo from Guam. We took 12 B-51s, and before we got to Iwo, we ran into a coal front. We had to penetrate a lot of, of weather. We had no idea what this storm was like because we had no weather information at that, time, at that point in time, uh, the commander of the P-51s is a bird colonel, and he told us to go to 25,000 feet and penetrate on the standard penetration of the front. At 25,000, we went in. We were in this storm. We, after briefing, uh, we were guessing anywhere from 2 to 15 minutes. No one knows how long we were in there. But no longer had we gotten in there and we lost complete control of the airplane. We were bouncing around like a P-51 
ping pong ball. We were bathed in solid light from lightning and roaring thunder, the tinkle of hail. We were at high enough altitude that we weren't getting any heavy hail. We have no idea which way was up. We, all we were doing was hanging on. The armor that we had when we go over a target was stored under our seats. These were that we would put on when we be in enemy territory. We seldom wore it. We'd sit on it because that was more dangerous mm -hmm. than anything coming in. But <coughs> those things started <coughs> started flying around, so we got bloodied and bruised from debris flying around in the flight deck and in the back. The airplane came out at 4,000 feet by itself. Uh, one engine was out. We lost three fighters. It was never heard from. We took the other nine back to war. So weather was worse than combat for us. Now we had some scary times in, uh, in combat. Really, at the Ferrari Arsenal, on the August the 14th, after the bombs, was one of the scares we had. It was a night mission. And often we would, a searchlight would hit us on other bombing missions. This night, a searchlight got on us, and we couldn't get rid of it. There's no way they feet of action will get rid of a, of a searchlight. And it's blinding. You can't see anything. With that light in the cockpit, but a radar bombardier in the back is shielded from from seeing this. But he indicated to us that we had an incoming kamikaze at about two o'clock. So this gave us time to take some evasive action, and we survived. But that was a, a scary time because at night you blind it, you can't see, and you just turn by the evasive action down at 90 degrees and fall away. We never did get hit by a bullet in the B-29, but we had some flak damage, but none that ever penetrated skin. We couldn't pressurize to head back to Tinian. Usually we would go back to high altitude to catch uh, the jet stream or the favorable wind because uh, depending on the target you had to watch your gasoline because we lost a lot of airplanes in the Pacific because they ran out of gas and there's no filling stations so between Japan. Uh, we were lucky that the Marines took Iwo because that eliminated the what fighters that were coming up, the few that still were on Iwo. The Marines lost 7,000 people. Marines in taking you all. But they figured that there were 20 some thousand B 29ers that used EWO after the Marines took it. I used it once when we had an engine that simply went out after we were over the target, didn't get hit, it just quit, put in a new engine, and we flew on back. You mentioned fighters that were lost on that one mission. Uh, did you lose? some friends while you were over there? On Tinian, we only lost, there were two crews to a Quonsetan, and we were both new replacement crews, so we had, didn't get to know them too well. But on our mission to Saga one night, and that's a story that we may come to later, the other crew didn't come back. They were the only one lost on that mission. So those are the only ones that we lost in combat that we knew. However, there was one crew that we got to know quite well that is well known in history, but it's in the back pages. At the end of the war, we were flying POW missions, flying supplies to POW camps, 
this crew was shot down by the Russians. They were strafed in the water. They, they all bailed out. They were all strafed in the water. There was one survivor, the navigator. I have pictures of him in all the garb that you have when you have to bail out. Say, this is what I'm going to wear the next time. He died not too long after the war for <coughs> jungle rot. And I, they subpoenaed me to, to uh, prove that he had spent time on the island to continue. That story is part of history. The Japanese actually, I mean, the Russians actually shot them down. They wanted to get them to fly a B-29 up to Vladivostok. <coughs> the Russians already had three B-29s. The Russians copied the B-29 and made several B-29s, and they were reverse engineered. This is a matter of history. They were reverse engineered and built B-29s because they didn't have an atomic a bomber capable of carrying an atomic bomb. I don't know for sure where I need to go from this. No, that's, that's very interesting. You mentioned a mission to Saga. Saga. Could you tell us about that? My radar bombardier had the shack record. That's the target record in the States. He was, <clears throat> and he, he's alive today, but has Alzheimer's. Uh, he was triple rated, navigator, bombardier, radar bombardier. We were a part of the we were a part of the 468th bomb group, so we got to lead the group on a bombing mission to Saga, which is a coastal target on the southern island of Kyushu. All the rest of the group was to bomb at his release of the bombs because we were bombing through the clouds. We got back after the mission. The next morning we'd always go to a briefing and they would have a big bulletin board of the different missions and the percent of the target destroyed. Saga was 0.00.00. Zero, zero zero. We had missed the target completely. And the 20th Air Force bomb wing shows all the missions from the bomb tonnage and so forth and the number of square miles destroyed. Saga is the only one that shows a negative, huh. navy, negative hit. Intelligence apologized. They had the tide in. The tide was out. He bombed from the, from the shoreline. So we bombed seven miles of tidal mud flats. Yeah. Years later, my wife and I in a Sunday school class in Little Rock, Arkansas, they introduced a lady who had been a missionary in Japan. After class, we talked to her and asked her where she was. She said, I was in Saga. It's hard to believe that here was the pilot that led that group yeah. that missed the city she was interned in. Gee, that's amazing. So we have uh, people other than myself that can vouch to this yeah. story. Where were you and what was your reaction when we dropped the two A-bombs over Japan? Well, people in the United States knew about it before, before we did. Uh, the night that Paul Tibbetts took the Enola Gay off Tinian, the airfield is on one far side of the island, the harbor is at the other. They came around and rang the sirens, and, which indicated get dressed, get ready for evacuation, put us on trucks and took us to Tinian Harbor. We had no idea. We had no briefing that we were going on a mission. We weren't prepared for a mission. So we went down to Tinian Harbor, down there for about 30 minutes, and put us back in trucks, came back and said, go back to sleep. 
the next day we were told that uh, a bomb had been dropped and that uh, the Enola Gay was down on the ramp. Well, it was casual to go down and take a look. I actually got a chance with the rest of us to go up and sit in the cockpit of the Enola Gay. We had wondered at the time what was going on over on the ramp of the 509th Bomb Group because they were kind of an elite group that uh, wasn't a part of any of the bombing missions. They were building a dimple in the ramp because the fat boy bomb could not be put in the bomb bay without making a dimple for it to fit into. There was a big celebration. Usually the enlisted men and the officers were segregated. They lived in different quarters. They had different officers clubs and enlisted men's clubs. That day there was no, no, everybody was the same. Enlisted men in the officers club, officers clubs and enlisted men. They decided that they probably shouldn't have a mission after that <laughs> because everybody was <laughs> pretty well sized. But as I mentioned, those bombs were dropped on the 6th and the 9th, and yet we pulled missions on the 10th, 11th, the last mission was on the 14th. So we continued to uh, pull missions. Were those incendiary missions? No, incendiary bombs? No, no, in fact, uh, our, ours was the Harare Arsenal and we, we had demolition that night. Okay. So we were after a specific target. target. A lot of people wonder, why did you drop all those incendiaries on civilians? And it is a question, but so much of their factories and their working was, a, was out in the suburbs. And Japan was not going to surrender. The, the, the bombing of Tokyo on March 9th, 10th, we say 9th and 10th because it was at night or late the 9th or early the 10th. More people died that night than in both atomic bombs. Mm -hmm. uh, it was a firestorm that happened uh, in Germany on one city when they incendiaries. But this this was like a blowtorch. And it just it Tokyo itself by the records, sixty some square miles were burned out. That night only sixteen. But in one night, sixteen square miles was burned out. I think you pointed out, but I believe history showed that without those incendiary Bombings, Japan probably would not have surrendered, would they? Well, even uh, General LeMay, who headed up the 21st Bomber Command of the B-29s, has written in here that perhaps the incendiaries, a few more weeks of incendiaries, Japan would have. So he, he too wondered about the atomic bomb, if, if it were actually necessary. But it happened. And I don't think I would be here today. Yep. I don't think my wife's twin brother would be here today yep. if we hadn't dropped the atomic yep. bomb. Because we probably would have had to invade Japan. Correct. It was scheduled to go in in November into Kyushu in November 1945. And there would literally, estimates would be millions mm -hmm. lost both sides. Yep. Because the Japanese lost more than we did. On the island of Iwo, they lost some 90, some thousand. On just the island of Iwo, where we lost 7,000. So the ratio was, was in the same way on Okinawa. Okinawa was the bloodiest island invasion. And that's where my uh, wife's brother was a part of that land. Describe your experiences after you flew your last mission between that time and the time you came back to the States. You had some interesting experiences. When, 
Well, after the war was over, uh, we we flew the 29 just just to keep our time up. And then everybody started going home, and the uh, island commander found that there were five of us who weren't married, five pilots, and he. Uh, that's just we volunteered to fly a couple B 29s to Clark Field in the Philippines. He promised that we could take them to B 29 and fly the sunset route back through Europe as a bonus. We got to Clark Field. We didn't think very far ahead. Uh, we didn't realize what kind of maintenance we would have. Uh, none of us were navigators. So we ferried a couple B-29, it takes uh, two pilots, a man in the back, an engineer to fly the airplane. We got over there, we had no maintenance, we couldn't fly the B-29. The island commander failed to give us written orders, we were there without orders. The army, which it was at the time, the army didn't know what to do with us. They fed us in houses and let us fly L-5s, uh, which is a high-powered Piper Cub, 145 horse, single-engine airplane, just to keep our time. They kept our time. They couldn't pay us. We had no <laughs> paper for it. So we had to write home for money, for what little money we needed. While we were there, a Chinese general found out we were there and tried to recruit us to fly for the nicest Chinese and took us up to Shanghai in a C-47, the DC-3. We got up there and found out that what they wanted us to fly. We were just old war-weary transports to fly the hump, over the hump, India, to fly supplies in for Chiang Kai-shek's army. Uh, the pay was great because we were making under four dollars a month with flight pay, and then we were offered a thousand dollars a month, and they'd pay us, feed us, and bank our money and chase Manhattan Bank. It was all lucrative. Twenty-five thousand dollar bonus after five years. We realized we wouldn't live five years because yeah. we understood what was going on with Mao Zedong coming down. And as we all know, Chiang Kai-shek was pushed off to the island of Formosa, which is now Taiwan. But while in the Philippines, we were flying L-5s, and we just had a ball. We'd go up and fly formation, fly all over the Philippines. Just, we, we did a few things we shouldn't have done. Uh, we're flying over Mount Pinatubo, which was then an inactive volcano. It was a beautiful place, so we'd fly over there, and uh, we got back one day, and the crew chief came in to the ready room after we were filling out our paper, and he said, where the hell have you guys been today? So we told him, we flew over Mount Pinatubo, he said, didn't we tell you that there were Hux, that there were Hux hideout? These are the communists of the Philippines. All five of us had rifle bullets in the fabric of our airplane. None of us got hurt. But the only bullets I got was after the war and the Hucks in the Philippines. <laughs> the five of us ended up coming home by boat around the Aleutians. And the memory we have of that is we like to froze to death in the Aleutians because we didn't have any warm weather clothes. We came back and landed at uh, Frisco and from that point on we came home. I'd like to get a picture of your crew on our tape if you have one available. Do you stay in touch? Have you stayed in touch over the years with uh, we did. your members? We did with many of them. I'm in touch with about four widows now because there's only three of us alive. Out of the 11, the radar bombardier and the left gunner. All the rest have died. 
you still have reunions? Of our group? I mean, of my crew, we never have had a reunion ourselves. But I've been to several of the 58th Bomb Wing reunions. The most memorable was in 1992 when Boeing invited all of the 20th Air Force, including the 58th Bomb Wing, to Seattle to celebrate the 50th anniversary of the first flight of the B-29. In this September, I plan to go, my wife and I, go to probably my last reunion. The group is planning, maybe this might be the last for the 58th bomb. They built a new building at Windsor Lock, Connecticut, the New England Air Museum. They put an airplane in, in there with memorabilia, and it turned out that the when they sent out bulletins over a period of three years as it was being built, they had a drawing of the airplane in the museum. And the airplane is a little organized. But when they dedicated the museum a few months ago, the board decided that maybe the naked lady was the thing to have in the museum. Could you so, hold that up a little bit flatter to make sure? There we go. So they put Jack's hack, his, <laughs> his nose art, in the airplane. But little Morgan Annie, for several months, was in the New England Air Museum. In September, we planned to go by. Uh, not many people will we recognize. Naturally, we were in our 20s, early 30s. Today, these I'm probably one of the younger, at age 83. Paul Tibbetts, as an example, is, I think, 96. Uh, most of the 58th Bomb Wing guys that left Salina in 19, early 1944 are in their late 80s and early 90s. Did you have any contact with the Japanese civilians during the war or any contact with Japanese civilians or soldiers after the war? Not before the war. But after the war, we have stories that I could take an hour in just those stories, but I'll limit it to one man by the name of Ken Nushimura. Here in Atlanta, he was a professor at Oglethorpe University and then ordained Methodist minister. He and his wife attended our St. James United Methodist Church. She was a soloist in the choir. One night at a choir party, it became known that we had something in common. Turned out he was 11 years old on the ground, March the 9th, 1945, during the incendiary bombings, and I was 21 dropping bombs on him. A few months later, he brought some students over from Japan, and at a church function, he spoke on forgiveness. I knew he was what he was leading up to. He told our story, and he forgave me for what I did on March the 9th, 1945, and he asked for forgiveness of the Japanese for what they did to America. It was quite an emotional time. Yeah, I'm sure it was. Ken Nishimura, uh, had been a, his family had been a Christian, been Christians, very few in, in Japan at the time, so they were rather ostracized at the time. He is now pastoring his mother's church in Japan right now. Another Elaine and I are, have been a part of Atlanta ministry with international students here in Atlanta for 20-some years. We have hosted dozens of international students, including Japanese. 
we have one Japanese couple that consider us as their American family. They live in Boston now. Uh, they remember us on birthdays, Mother's Day birthdays, holidays, whatever. So we've been in contact with them for more than probably 15 years. They, like many of the students, know very little about the Pacific War, as they call it. So only when the Japanese students would bring up the subject would I say anything. We'd have students in our home that we'd find out what city they were from. I'd know that that's a city I bombed. I would not say anything about it. But one student, a Romy, uh, noticed some of the memorabilia and became inquisitive. And she related that her grandfather, as a, as a young person, who lived in Uwata down near the Shimano Senki Straits, walked 75 miles to Hiroshima after the bomb. She, of course, was not born. I asked her if she'd like to see a B-29, and she said yes. So we took her out to Dobbins Air Force Base, and we have a photo of her when she asked if she could touch the airplane. So we have a photo of her touching the airplane. So there's been some emotional times yes, okay. after the war. But the Japanese people that we have known and we've heard from the parents of, of students. We've had to have a member of our church who can interpret Japanese and Chinese uh, to let us know what these letters say. Uh, these people are just like we are. How we got into a war with warring factions is, is something else. The hatred of the Japanese is still justified by those that face the Japanese face to face. I was lucky. I did not fight in a trench and face the enemy. I was high and dry. And in, in a sense, it was a great adventure. It was scary at times, but life is scary at times, no matter what. Before we conclude, could you Tell us a little bit about your connection to the book, The Flyboys. Back in 2001, the author, uh, James Bradley, contacted me because I was the only relative of Glenn Fraser, my cousin, that he could find. Over several months, he contacted me about information I knew about Glenn and my experience as a B-29 pilot. When the, the book came out, when the book came out, he uh, sent me a copy, and of course I read it. I had very little to do with the hardback book of Flyboys. It's just a matter of my having met him. In, uh, 2003, after the book came out, I began getting contact with so many people. Just as an example, a lady in our bridge club recognized a name in the book from a boy that had gone to high school with her. Turned out that he was my friend's best buddy. She found out that he was still alive in Fort Scott, Kansas. Got his phone number. I called him talked to him, he couldn't believe he was talking to the cousin of his best buddy. He's just one of the many contacts. And at that, another contact was that I found Glenn's mother. In the early part of the book, page five, he states that all eight mothers died before they knew what happened to their son. It turned out that I found Glenn's mother at age 97. I was afraid to call her and let her know what happened, so I called Bradley. Bradley phoned and told her the story and sent her a book. She read the book, and then I have had been in contact with her by phone and by letter uh, 
since that time. Bradley was right. He states that she would probably be 97 years old if she were alive. Turned out she was 97. On May the 3rd of this year, 2006, she celebrated her 100th birthday well. with a celebration at the rest home she's in in Grand Junction, Colorado. And through the Flyboy book, uh, which is in their library, we sent out from the library, they contacted the Navy, and the Navy presented her with a flag in honor of her son on her 100th birthday, just this May. What a wonderful story. Ian? Okay, the, the Flyboy book just literally enhanced my later years because of so many contacts. Uh, we were contacted by the uh, Confederate Air Force, the Commemorative Air Force, stating that they were going to induct the eight flyboys into the Hall of Fame in October 2004, and we were invited to come and accept the medallion for Glenn since his mother could not go. On our way out, we stopped to pick up a stopped at one of the Air Force bases overnight and they had just put the new book, paperback, on the shelves and we found that there was an afterword that the author had written that describes how I found the author's, I found my cousin's mother. We attended the ceremonies along with, they inducted several others into the Hall of Fame. Paul Tibbetts of the Enola Gay was there, uh, Tex Hill was of the AVG, flew P-40s before he flew with the uh, National Chinese before the war. We met air heroes of the world. Uh, got to speak to them, got their autographs in a two-hour reception. So my ego was inflated by meeting <laughs> all of these people, including the co-pilot of 